Do you please shut off your cell phones? If you haven't grabbed a water or a soda right now, make sure you do so so you're comfortable. sitting at table 42 or you're in the back, would you please move up to the front? Do you see Dr. Eschbach right here? Would you raise your hand? She really needs the tables to fill in. So this lovely lady right here, our graduate program director of school counseling, the chair of the wonderful Department of Counseling and Human Services. Oh, okay. Right here, we need uh, filled in. Thank you. OK, would tables 42? All right, tables 42, 43, 44, and 45, would you please move up front? Table two and four, because we've got big prizes we're giving away, I got to tell you. You're missing it if you're not at tables two, four, and uh, five. Raise your hand. Table two's right here. Come on up. Here's table two right here. Big prizes. Right, this is it. Table two is filling up. Big prizes. Table four over here needs some people. Table one. Okay, let's get started. Everybody should be in their seats. First of all, welcome. Would, what a wonderful, in this room, we have freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, and graduate students from the Panuska College of Professional Studies. We have faculty, we have staff. It is a wonderful experience. It's a dream come true. My name is Deborah Pellegrino, and I am the Dean of PCPS, and I welcome you tonight for a special treat. First of all, last May, when our lovely seniors graduated, I can still remember what I said. I went up to the mic. They were all getting nervous. Would Dr. Pellegrino mispronounce my name or not? And that's why I want to know you as freshmen, so you can tell me from your freshman year how to pronounce your name so I don't have any problems when that fourth year comes around. But I said, we are the helping professions. We are on fire and we get hired. And I can still remember Diane Posgate saying, that's right. Because at Panuska College of Professional Studies, we are the helping professions. Do you know last year, our undergraduates and graduate students did over 14,000 hours of service learning. Could you please give Panuska College a giant hand? So, again, the 
the University of Scranton is a Jesuit Catholic institution, but Panuska College requires everyone, everyone to graduate to do service learning. And as freshmen, you should be saying, why? Why do we do service learning? Why do we have to do so many projects? What does that have to do with my education? Because in this room, we have future nurses, counselors, physical therapists, occupational therapists, teachers, exercise science physiologists, um, human resources, health administrators, and we believe in the helping professions, but at a Jesuit institution, we walk in faith and justice. Now, with that, why are we here? Because, first of all, the person that I'm going to introduce to you is a special treat. He is a member of our Board of Trustees. He is a wonderful Jesuit Catholic pastor in a very small town called Kansas City, Missouri. He is getting ready to do an adventure, but above all, he believes in faith and social justice. That's what we're about. With that, I give you Father Matthew Rule, pastor of St. Francis Xavier Church in Kansas City, Missouri, and he is getting ready to take you on a special ride. So sit back and enjoy yourself. First of all, thank you all very much for being here. I know it was a mandatory, but it's still sweet of you to show up. And uh, <clears throat> I guess I, I, this, this talk, I'm going to be giving this talk probably over 100 times in the next year. It's kind of an unveiling. And I hope that what this, this little chat does is it gives you some rationalization for the kind of work that many of you are going to go into. <clears throat> so let's just start with this. The word charity, the word charity is a lot like the word Christmas. It has taken on all these accretions. So you, when you say the word Christmas, people think, well, Christmas trees, presents, people think parties, they'll think all kinds of things. And some might even think, well, uh, it's about a little baby being born in Bethlehem. Well, charity is the same way. We think of all kinds of things. We think of charities that we donate to or charities that we volunteer. And that's all good. And we think every nice action is a charity. But charity has a very specific meaning. And it's taken on all these accretions. <clears throat> and like Christmas, though, charity is born. The root, the etymology of the word comes from scripture. As surely as the word Christmas comes from the Gospels, so does the word charity. So I'm going to ask you now to listen to a story and maybe hear it the way you've never heard it before. It comes from the Gospel of Luke. Just then a lawyer, now a lawyer was someone who was versed in the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, also called the law. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And I'm going to ask you to pay attention to that, eternal life. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live but wanting to justify himself, that is to say, wanting to know that he got to go to heaven, that he was worthy of eternal life. But wanting to justify himself, the lawyer asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. 
Then he put them on his own animal. He put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. Listen to this now. Listen. Jesus said, go and do likewise. All right. If you're going to understand that story, then you need to know that a priest represented the highest level of religious authority at the time. Levites were very pious lay people. And Samaritans, I don't have time to get into everything about Samaritans, but just suffice it to say there was about 500 years of enmity between Samaritans and Jews. And so what is Jesus saying in this story? My brothers and sisters, Listen carefully. Love your neighbor is not a suggestion. It's not a guideline. It's not even a hope. It's a command. It's a command. And who is your neighbor? Any body who needs your help, including your enemy which is what a Samaritan was to a Jew. So who gained eternal life in that story? Not the priest, not the pious layperson, the Samaritan who was outside of salvation in the view of the Jew. Listen please to just one more story because there's, when Jesus said the two great commandments, love God and love your neighbor. Guess what he never defined? What it means to love God. Love him with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. It's not a definition. It's just a, a reaffirmation. Love God. Jesus never defined what it meant to love God. But he defined in no uncertain terms what it meant to love your neighbor. And so now I give you another story. And maybe hear this for the first time, freshly. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it we saw you, a stranger, and welcomed you? or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. 
naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. That story is much more profound than I think most Catholics give it credit. See who gets saved. It wasn't the pious Jew or the good Christian. It was anybody. Jesus doesn't say you have to be rich or straight or a female or a male. Any body who feeds the hungry or clothes the naked or visits the sick, the lonely, the imprisoned, those are the ones who get to go to eternal life. I don't know what it means to love God, but Jesus makes it very, very clear what it means to love your neighbor. In the Gospel of James, or the letter of James, James says a funny thing. He says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go, go in peace, keep warm, eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself has no no works. It's dead. And then he says something very interesting. He said, in the Gospels, this is James now, in the Gospels, the only persons who know who Jesus is, is the devil. The devil had more faith than the followers of Jesus. He knew who Jesus, I know who you are, you're the Holy One of God, keep quiet, come out of him. The devil had faith. What the devil didn't have was good works. This understanding of neighbor is such a cornerstone in our faith and was such a cornerstone in the early church that people like James and the early martyrs understood that it was a way of life. If you went to the Eucharist, if you shared in the Eucharist, you went out and you helped the hungry and the naked and the poor and the cold. It was part and parcel. And what I'm afraid of in our church today too often is that people think they've covered their bases if they go to church, say their rosary, blah, 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 blah. There's a great story. It's early church of St. Lawrence in about the year 258. Lawrence was a deacon in the church in Rome. And this is one of my favorite stories about an early, early saint. There was a great persecution. It was one of the first persecutions. And the emperor was Valerian. And Valerian sends out to all his prefects. He says, all right, you can now persecute the Christians. And before you persecute them, though, get all the money from them that you can. So the prefect in Rome called all the Christians together. He chopped off the pope's head, chopped off a few Christians, And Lawrence was a deacon, and Lawrence came up to the prefect, and the prefect knew that it was the deacon's job to take care of all the holy vessels in the church. So the prefect says, Lawrence, you go on back into the city, and you bring me all the riches of your church. Lawrence said, it's going to take me three days to do this. And the prefect said, I will meet you in the hall in three days. Lawrence goes out. <clears throat> prefect goes away. Three days later, the prefect comes into the hall and Lawrence comes in. And Lawrence comes in and what does he have? 
He's gone into Rome and he's picked up all the lame, all the crippled, all the prostitutes, all the strangers, all the beggars, all the prisoners. He marches all these people into the hall and the prefect says, Lawrence, what are you doing? And Lawrence says, you said you wanted the riches of the church. Well, here they are. Well, the prefect didn't think that was very funny, so as the story goes, he barbecued Lawrence. But that was the understanding, church, that Christians took care of those in need, even if they were your enemy. So here we get to the word charity. In this day and age with these computers, there's all kinds of new words. The vocabulary in the last 10 years has blossomed. Well, there was a new word in the Middle Ages. And the new word embraced a new reality. And the word was caritas. And literally, what that means is Christian Love. If you go to your dictionaries and you look up the etymology or Google it, whatever you want to do, you will see that the word charity comes from the word caritas. And the word caritas is Latin. That's our word. It came from our tradition to name this reality of love of neighbor. That's where it came from. Now, charity can mean anything. A charity can be a tax dump, a place where some rich guy throws his money to get himself in the lower tax bracket. A charity can be a political, a political thing. A charity can be a place where somebody goes just to get out of the house. I have, a, I have a parish, and I was talking to this guy. He always volunteers. And I said, Joe, I sure appreciate your volunteering all these hours. And he said, well, Father, I'd do anything to get away from my wife. Is that charity? Not by the strict definition, it's not. Not by the strict definition. So this leads me to a story. <clears throat> About a year ago, I was on what we call the Katy Trail in Missouri. It, it's, a, it's a rails to trails, bicycle trail from Kansas City to St. Louis. And it was the springtime, and it was a lovely day, and I was on my bike with a friend, and I thought to myself, it would sure be nice to bicycle across the whole country. And then I go, wait a minute, I got a sabbatical in 2010, I can bicycle across the whole country. And then a little voice said to me, you could do this for a greater good. I said, all right, God, angel, whatever you are. What's the greater good for which I can do this? You show me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. About six months later, I was at a talk that Mike Halterman, who's the, CF, the CEO of Catholic Charities in Kansas City, and he said that Catholic Charities put together a paper that hopes to cut poverty in half in, a, in this country by the year 2020. And I thought, poverty in half? Cut poverty in half in this country. It was the most absurd and audacious thing I had ever, ever heard. So I said, by God, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. I will ride my bike across the country for Catholic charities and begin to cut poverty in half in America because Catholic Charities does the very thing that is so near and dear to the Catholic heart. No other institution, Catholic institution in America, feeds the hungry and clothes the naked like Catholic Charities. And so the ride was planned and you look on your table, there's the route. In Labor Day, Memorial Day of 2010, me and a team of, right now it's eight, it's probably going to go up to ten riders. We're going to go up to Cape Flattery, Washington, which is the northwestmost corner of the United States. 
and we are going to bicycle all the way across the country, diagonally, 5,052 miles, down to Florida, down to Key West. And all along the way, all along the way, we're going to say Mass every night because I want everybody to know that this is a Catholic enterprise. Methodists, Episcopalians, they are welcome to join us and they will. Catholic Charities serves everybody. But there's a reason I want to make this Catholic. Who's going to be helped? Listen, you guys. The government let out these statistics last month. About 14% of your fellow American citizens live below the poverty line. 14%. Do you know how many parents go to bed at night not knowing what they're going to feed their children in the morning? Do you have any idea how many parents go to bed at night hoping to God that either they or their children don't suffer some kind of sickness that will require hospitalization because they can't afford health care. Do you have any idea how many Americans are looking for work right now? It's an unbelievable state of affairs. Who is this ride for? My brothers and sisters, this ride is for the poor. Who else is this ride for? This ride is for the country. This poverty rate is crippling our country. It's pover this poverty rate is crippling our nation. And who else is this ride for? Well, I'll tell you who else it's for. In the past few years, one of the things that has made me the tiredest and the most frustrated are all the divisions in the church, the anger. Who can go to communion? Not if you vote for Obama, you can't. Latin mass, English mass, communion on the tongue, communion in the hand, and the arguments just get louder and louder, and the self-righteousness just continues and continues. This ride's for the church. This ride is going to be for the church. Maybe, just maybe, if we get back to our Christian basics and we understand that love of neighbor is more important than whether or not you receive communion on the tongue or on the hand, maybe if we begin to appreciate the beauty of love your neighbor, we can begin to unify our church. Mother Teresa, you know what? Here's the deal. You know what she did? All Mother Teresa did was go out into the street, pick up dying people, and keep them company when they died. That's what Mother Teresa did. It's the simplest thing in the world. There's a dying person. I'll pick him up, take him over to our house, and he doesn't have to die alone. That's charity. What could be more? There's not one person in this room who couldn't do that. And yet, Mother Teresa gets the Nobel Prize for doing it. And nobody questioned whether or not she deserved the Nobel Peace Prize. Mother Teresa becomes a saint because she picked up dead people, dying people. And nobody, but nobody wonders if she should be called a saint. 
Who is this ride for? It's for the church, that we might be united again. My brothers and sisters, <clears throat> whether you participate in the ride or not, that's up to you, entirely up to you. You're certainly welcome. There's any number of ways you can participate. Happy to have a little ride up here in Scranton. Any way you want to join up, you feel free. Whether you join up the ride or not, that's up to you. But please, listen now. Please, 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 please. Let's love our neighbor. Let's let go of all the self-righteousness, all the anger, and all the division that grips so much of our Catholic Church. Together, let us feed the hungry. Together, let us clothe the naked. Together, let us visit the sick, the lonely, the imprisoned. Together, let us console the inconsolable. Let us be so kind, so gracious, so utterly charitable that people will once again say of us, oh, see how they love one another. Thank you very much. We have a very small gift of our appreciation to Father Matt that's coming up right now, but four years from now, when you're ready to graduate and you're walking across that stage, I want you to look me in the eye and say, I understand why I'm in the helping professions at Penusca College of Professional Studies. Because many of you aren't aware already that we run a food pantry, a clothes closet, a free medical clinic for the underserved, counseling clinics, PT clinics, peacemakers, all in the Leahy Center. You, the students, last year have done so much you decided with your swipe card that everything that was left over would be donated to the poor in the Leahy Center. Most of the people that we serve are immigrants. They're from Brazil. Our languages are Hispanic, Portuguese, and Hindi. Who does the translations? You, the students. Come down to the lower level of McGurin Hall. Every department in Penusca College of Professional Studies walks the talk. I just want to thank you so much. And now our graduate students are going to do breakouts. But first, would you give Father Matt one more round of applause? <laughs> Father Matt, would you please accept this from Penusca College of Professional Studies for your cycle for change? Thank you very much. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions for Father Matt before Dr. Eschbach starts? Okay, so Dr. Eschbach, we're gonna turn it over to you and your graduate students now. And then we also have surprises and gifts uh, for many of you in this audience tonight. So Dr. Eschbach. No Reno's heart, and I think it relates a lot to the service learning activities that we in the Penusca College of Professional Studies do. So she, um, if all of my facilitators and volunteers and leaders, if you want to go to the tables where you're assigned, that would be great. She would like you to discuss some of the ideas that were brought up by Father Rule's presentation for just a few minutes, and um, there are several volunteers that will go around and give you guys some, sit down and give you guys some directions, okay? So listen to the volunteer. There, there are some volunteers that have two tables, so it will take you a while to get started, but go ahead. And thanks for your great attention to this. <clears throat> 